Hello, I'm Robin Young, the founder and CEO of RRY Publications and Pearl Diver Technologies. I'll be your moderator for this fascinating masterclass on the emergence of facet replacement as a new modality for treating degenerative spondylolisthesis and spinal stenosis. This is a particularly timely subject as the debate around how to treat this growing patient population is gathering interest, not only among clinicians, but also at both the hospital and the payer level. Should you fuse them? Should you decompress only? Or is there an emerging alternative that takes the best of both options? I'm joined by three thought leaders and esteemed researchers and scientists, Dr. Korik, Professor Vilke, and Dr. Anikstein, whom I will introduce prior to their presentations. I know tonight's masterclass will generate among you, our audience, a lot of thought, questions, comments. So as you're listening to the presentations, please do make frequent use of that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So where do we begin? I suggest as a way to contextualize tonight's masterclass subject, we start with the earliest pedicle screw-based posterior motion preservation device, which was the Groff ligament invented by Dr. Henri Groff. This French surgeon came up with the idea of looping a pair of braided polyester cables around pedicle screws in order to constrain motion across the unstable spinal segment. His hypothesis, which found expression in his implant, proved to be effective in constraining flexion extension and opened a new way of thinking about spinal stabilization and, of course, prompted a new generation of posterior non-fusion devices. The first generation of dynamic stabilization devices entered the European market 25 years ago. You may well be familiar with the DINASYS system from Zimmer, now known as MV, the ISOBAR from Scientex, the Cosmic Mia from Ulrich, and many others. These implants are best described as internal braces, which allow controlled movement of the lumbar spine motion segment. The devices were used extensively outside the U.S., but because none were ever approved by the FDA uh, with a motion preservation indication, they did not get traction in the United States. In response to the shortcomings of dynamic stabilization, the concept of facet replacement began to get traction in 2005. The thought behind facet replacement was to address late-stage degenerative spondylolisthesis and spinal stenosis without fusion in order, to achieve, in order to achieve better clinical outcomes with a wider decompression and to remove all posterior pain generators. Surgeons couldn't decompress the facet joints with dynamic stabilization devices. These dynamic stabilization devices simply weren't designed to withstand shear forces on the lumbar spine in the absence of the posterior joints. Therefore, facet replacement technology was designed to replace the function of all structures removed during decompression, including the facet joints, in order to be clinically effective in treating advanced spondylolisthesis and spinal stenosis. The next generation of posterior devices recreated normal motion in flexion, extension, lateral bending, and axial rotation, but more importantly, to withstand shear forces. Three devices emerged around the same time. TOPS from Impliant, TFAS, T-F-A-S, from Arcus, and the Acadia from Facet Solutions. The top system was the first facet replacement surgery performed in the world by Dr. Louis Pimenta in Brazil in January 2005. Then later that same year, Dr. Scott Webb implanted the first TFAS device in Romania. These devices were joined by the Acadia facet replacement system in 2006, and each of these three devices entered FDA clinical trials 15 years ago. The three companies eventually ran out of money. That effectively ended the studies. The TFAS and the Acadia system uh, projects were mothballed, but the TOPS device was acquired by Premia Spine in 2011. And that management, led by Ron Sacker, initiated a new IDE study in 2017. The current TOPS ID study completed enrollment and submitted for FDA approval earlier this year, which is why. I am so excited to hear our presentations this evening. This is going to be, I think, terrific. With that, 
It is my pleasure and honor to hand things over to Dr. Yoram Anikstein. Dr. Anikstein has the longest continuous experience with facet replacement technology. He is the head of spine and orthopedic departments at Asaf Harofei Medical Center and lecturer at Tel Aviv University's School of Medicine. Dr. Anikstein earned his medical degree from Hadassah Hebrew University and was a Leatherman Spine Fellow at the University of Louisville before returning to Israel and assuming the post of the head of the spine unit is Asaf Harofei Medical Center. Dr. Anikstein has presented at many Spine Society meetings, including NAS, AAOS, World Spine, Eurospine, and the AO Spine Symposium. He has over 60 publications and presentations, and with more than 15 years of clinical experience with the top system, it's really a pleasure to welcome Dr. Anikstein. Okay, hi, my name is Yoram Anikstein from Israel in Tel Aviv. Uh, and my disclosure is that, that I'm a consultant to Premier Spine, and I'm actually the medical monitor of Premier Spine uh, IDE study in the States. And uh, if I'm looking back maybe 20 years ago, when I came back from uh, my fellowship in the States, I made contact with a small Israeli company, and we discussed the idea of doing a facet arthroplasty. These were the days of the golden era of motion preservation. And after the development that took maybe two years, uh, some of it with Professor Wilke and we looked uh, with uh, Uwe Arnin, which is a very talented engineer, uh, this patent was registered. And the idea was to uh, create an implant that will restore the biomechanics and preserve the kinematics of the motion segments after destabilization. Uh, destabilization means after a very wide decompression that includes laminectomy and bilateral facetectomy. And on the left side, you see what I call the prototype device that we used since 2006 up to 2010. And then we have the current design that was used in the IDE study. Uh, the main three goals of this implant is to achieve a very wide decompression, uh, laminectomy, bilateral facetectomy, taking off the pass interarticularis, uh, and here you can see the exiting nerve roots and the dural sacs completely decompressed. And then to treat uh, existing instability, usually uh, degenerative spondylolisthesis, and also treating the facet pain. The main concern on initial thoughts about this type of device, which is screw, uh, pedicle screw uh, device, is that the ped pedicle screw may get loose. We know very well that with pseudoarthrosis, when there is motion, eventually the screw may get loose, like you see on the left side on, the X, on this X-ray. Uh, so a lot of thought went into achieving good or better purchase of this screw. And the first one is using a surface treated screws, like you see here. Uh, and this was tested uh, in vivo in a ship model, showing better integration of the screw to the bone. And then there was another study that was done uh, in New York and published in Spine Journal in 2008, comparing the TOPS device to the Dynasys. Actually, the Dynasys was used as a fusionless fusion device. It is almost as stiff as fusion devices. And what was examined is the load and the moments on the pedicle screw throughout motion. And what they saw is that the load on the pedicle screw was much lower and more homogeneous with the tops compared to the dynasis. And this is relatedly related mainly to the stiffness of the dynasis compared to the tops. The tops has a lot of motion. So there's load sharing with the disc and the remain ligaments like the ALL and PLL. And the, uh, the fact that with the tops, you have cross link that interconnect two screws on the same vertebra, that means that you have a more homogeneous load on the screws and less uh, probability for screw loosening. And what we see after 14 years of clinical usage around Europe and Israel and in the States, uh, more than 5,000 screw implanted, only 0.2% of screw loosening. So this was the main concern, but eventually we learned that uh, this is not a problem to look now. Now, the first study that was done uh, was uh, under the uh, Ministry of Health in Israel. They allowed us to do 10 cases. It was a pilot 
single arm, single center study, very small one, uh, very uh, similar criteria that what was used in the IDE study. And this was published in several papers, but this is the last one looking at the long-term long results after 11 years of study. Uh, we had a early failure with one of the 10 prostheses. This is only three months after implantation. You see this, the TOPS is locked in, a, in extension, and this patient was revised to fusion. But then all other nine cases are still in the spine of the uh, of these patients. Looking at 11 years, uh, very nice results. Looking at the uh, leg pain via VASCO, this decreased from 85 to less than 10 in two years, and then less than 20 in 11 years, and VAS for the back pain again from 55 to 15 in 11 years. The also Street Disability Index and the SF36 uh, show uh, good function of these patients. Uh, keep in mind that these patients were in their 60s when they operated, and 11 years later, they are now in their 70s with, uh, we expected, decrease, some in, decrease in function. Looking at the motion of the implant, we looked at seven years. The, this patient didn't want to repeat x-rays again and again, so we have seven-year follow-up that showed some decrease in motion with time. I'll show you uh, a case from this early study with a prototype device. This is a 52-year-old male with neurogenic claudication. He was operated on December 2006. This is his post-op x-rays. And then you can see the pre-op MRI on the left side compared to the 11-year follow-up MRI on the right side. Almost no change in the degenerative uh, finding on the spine. This is the adjacent level of the 3-4 level above the implant with no stenosis, no severe facet arthrosis or spondy. This is the level that was operated, widely decompressed, and this is the adjacent level below the implant. Again, uh, canal is open, no spondylolisthesis. So at 11 years, we had no screw loosening. We had one early revision surgery due to implant failure at three months, but this did not repeat itself. And then there was a high level of satisfaction and, and fact function. Looking at the MRI at 11 years, uh, adjacent level stenosis was seen in one case at 11 years, adjacent level spondylolisthesis in no case. And what you can see here is some early degenerative changes in the facet at the level above, at the L3, L4. This, uh, this was seen in four cases out of nine. So this is how it looks, some facet fluid uh, on MRI. Now, uh, since 2010, uh, we used, we had a commercial use of the new implant, the, the one that was used in the IDE studies, uh, and uh, we had it in 158 single level uh, TOPS cases done in my institute. The uh, revision rate was 5.7%. Looking at the revision uh, after this more than 10 years of experience. These are the nine revisions. The first two on the table on the right were done elsewhere, not in my institution. So we don't have the full data about, uh, about the reason for revision, but we have the data for seven revision. We see two revision were done for uh, adjacent level disease. And this was revised to extend uh, extending a fusion device to the tops. We have this uh, option to interconnect uh, fusion to the tops. The other, other seven revisions were just replacing the tops that failed with a new device. So in 15 years of experience, of clinical experience with this device, since the early design and then the current one, we had good clinical results in our hand, better than what we see with fusion, mild deterioration of motion over time, very low adjacent segment disease, rate and actually no screw loosening and 6% revision rate, which is comparable to or even better than what we see with revision cases. So when you uh, think of using this implant, I think you should consider three main key points. The first is patient selection. In our cohort, in our study, we had strict patient selection. This device was intended, was 
designed to treat spondylolisthesis with stenosis. It was not designed to treat disc problems. So keeping this strict indication will lead to success. The other key point is doing a very wide decompression by taking the lamina completely and complete facetectomy on both sides and having a, a, a free space pedicle to pedicle. And the third key point is following the surgical technique, at least on the first cases, using the special de devices that were designed to implant this device. Now, who, who is the right patient for having the first case? It should be between, a, a patient between 50 to 70 year old with leg dominant pain, and his main complaint should be claudication. He should have degenerative spondylolisthesis and severe or at least significant stenosis on the MRI and no significant disc problem. This means no disc herniation, but also I look at modic changes. I don't like to see modic type changes in the disc with this patient. On physical exam, I like to see him bending forward completely painlessly. That means the disc is not a problem. The disc is not symptomatic and he has a positive extension test, meaning it's mainly a facet uh, problem or and stenosis. So thank you very much. And I'd like to thank you for having me uh, speaking in this uh, webinar. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Anikstein. You've clearly made important contributions to the advancement of facet replacement technology. Our next faculty member is Dr. Dom Korik. Dr. Korik will discuss his clinical experience with a variety of facet replacement and disc replacement technologies. He will also present data, however, from the current TOPS IDE trial. Dr. Dom Couric practices neurosurgery at Carolina Neurosurgery and Spine Associates in Charlotte. He is the Executive Medical Director of Spine First, a professor of spine surgery at Wake Forest University, and serves as, or has served as Chief of the Department of Neurosurgery at Carolina's Medical Center. He has served as a principal investigator in over 30 IDE and IND trials and was national lead investigator or co-lead investigator in 10 of those trials. He's contributed more than 100 peer-reviewed articles and over 18 book chapters to the scientific literature. Dr. Korak is past president of the Southern Neurosurgical Society, past president of ISASS, and the immediate past chair of the AANS-CNS Joint Section on Spine and Peripheral Nerves. Dr. Cor, the uh, program is yours. Hi, it's Dom Cork from Carolina Neurosurgery and Spine. I'm pleased to be here uh, discussing facet replacement uh, uh, treatment for stenosis and spondylolisthesis. So my history with motion preservation dates back to the early 2000s. We've actually been involved with uh, over 20 IDE uh, and IND studies involved with motion preservation, uh, dating back to the first study in 2002, which was a cervical uh, arthroplasty study. Uh, we've done cervical arthroplasty as well as lumbar total disc replacement. And starting in 2006, we've also been involved with facet replacement. We've been directly involved with both TOPS IDE studies that was starting in 2006, as well as this, the, the modified device starting in 2017. And we're also involved with the Acadia device, uh, which was in between those two. And you see here on the screen, the Acadia device, and then the TOPS devices on the right. So what was the initial attraction to facet replacement, uh, especially compared to uh, lumbar total disc replacement? A uh, couple of things. One is, is that this is a indication for degenerative spondylolisthesis and stenosis. This is an indication that is widely accepted. And, and there is, although some controversy surrounding spondylolisthesis, there at least is uh, uh, a, 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 a big group of people who would agree with the fact that there is a space for decompression and stabilization. Certainly there is a space for decompression alone. This is in contradistinction to total disc replacement, which primarily treats axial back pain, which is even more controversial. And there are certainly folks who would argue that that shouldn't be treated from a surgical perspective at all. So this is a much more straightforward indication. Uh, and the, the second uh, potential benefit of total disc replacement 
vis-a-vis -vis, uh, its approach, and that is the, the posterior approach to the lumbar spine. That is the workhorse approach to the lumbar sp spine, again, in contradistinction to, to lumbar total disc replacement. The lumbar total disc replacement uh, is an anterior retroperitoneal approach. Uh, again, although a common approach to the spine is not considered to be the, the most common and, and most straightforward approach to the spine. And lastly, what has really uh, kept my attention with total disc with uh, facet replacement has been the excellent clinical outcomes. And, and again, those are outcomes that I have dating back to my patients in 2006. So I've got 15 year plus outcomes on my initial cohort of patients. Uh, as far as the keys to success for this procedure are the keys to success with any surgical procedure and that is patient selection. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And the second is, is that the wide decompression that the placement of the device really necessitates really also leans you towards really outstanding clinical outcomes. So the first case I'm gonna give as an example is the original uh, TOPS uh, system. And so this is a little bit of a bigger system uh, as far as the, si the actual size of the system, but you see a grade one L45 degenerative spondylolisthesis kind of mobile spot. We don't have flexion extension views, but it's a mobile spondylolisthesis with moderate central and moderate to severe foraminal stenosis. The patient presents with classic neurogenic claudication or radiculopathy. In this case, it was neurogenic claudication. Uh, and the patient undergoes a complete laminectomy with uh, placement of the TOPS device. And again, since this is one of our earlier patients, we have out to six year follow up and actually beyond this. <clears throat> but the six year follow up, the ODI for back and leg pain goes down to zero, really, to the five, and then the six year follow up, uh, which is obviously an outstanding, uh, <coughs> an outstanding outcome given the fact that typically. I spend my day with an ODI somewhere between two and four. So this patient has done very well. Here's one of the cases from the Acadia study. And you see the pre-op similarly is a degenerative spondylolisthesis and L4-5 that is mobile. We do have the flexion extension views and it is clearly mobile here. <coughs> we see at three year follow-up, the Acadia device with maintenance of motion and here we have some of the uh, IDE clinical results from the Acadia study. Ultimately, the Acadia enrolled uh, nearly 300 patients uh, and the outcomes were outstanding as far as the 15 point improvement of ODI, but it got tripped up by its reoperation rate. And if you look at the reoperation rate here, it was higher than we would like to see and was higher than its um, than its randomized uh, uh, group, uh, which was the control group, which was posterior lateral fusion. And that brings us to the current top system. So the current top study randomizes to uh, T lift, standard inner body fusion and pedicle screw fixation. And the current tops device you see is a little bit more low profile. It's actually about 30% smaller than the original device. Here you see um, moderate central stenosis with the classic trefoil kind of narrowing of the canal, moderate to severe foraminal stenosis. You see the severe degenerative facet disease with the hypertrophied facet and fluid in the facet here uh, at L4-5. Um, this patient undergoes the, the same decompression stabilization and you see the placement of the TOPS device, which we, is pedicle based and we like to place it right in the middle there. Similar ODI as far as back and leg pain, patient has done well. So when we talk about facet replacement's role in the degenerative cascade, what we want to see in an ideal situation is a reasonably healthy disc with a degenerated facet. The facet should be mild to moderate to severe, uh, uh, moderate to severe degenerative facet disease. What we don't want to see is a severely degenerated disc because that doesn't give us enough room between the pedicles necessarily to place the device. We need at least four millimeters of room. And we don't want to see uh, the, this combination of totally degenerated disc and totally degenerated facet because the idea for facet replacement 
is to maintain motion as to as opposed to restore motion. So what we would like to see is a good disc with facet disease, mild to moderate to severe. Even in this concept of moderate to severe, it's okay as long as the disc is reasonable, but we don't want to have severe and severe. So the idea of facet replacements, and this is non-coincidentally what the idea, what the IDE uh, inclusion criteria looks like, at least moderate stenosis, grade one degenerative spondylolisthesis, at least four millimeters of disc space height, and back over uh, back pain, uh, leg pain predominating over back pain. So it's a, a predominantly radicular procedure. It either deals with radicular pain or neurogenic claudication. Uh, and again, um, that's in contradistinction to lumbar total disc replacement. Uh, as far as patients to stay away from, you don't want to have free large free fragment herniated disc that indicates an incompetence of the, the disc itself, disc height less than four millimeters. We don't want to see a high grade listhesis because that could be difficult to, to, to restore alignment as well as to maintain motion. We don't want to see so scoliosis beyond mild 10 degrees. We don't want to see osteopenia, osteoporosis. Technically, osteoporosis is defined as a T-score of negative 2.5 or below. We like to keep it at about negative 2.0 uh, or above. Uh, and we, we, again, the patient, you, we should be treating radicular pain, leg pain primarily, or neurogenic claudication as opposed to axial uh, mechanical back pain. As far as the current uh, top system, this is the actual device that we see here. It is a robust biomechanical device. It is 30% smaller than the original device. There have been two published studies with long-term follow-up in the European literature. The new ID study was enrolled in 2017. It was initiated and completed enrollment in 2022. Uh, and is currently uh, closed to enrollment and submission is being prepared for the FDA uh, uh, as we speak. So this is the actual uh, implantation technique. We see the patient here and then some of the x-rays. Now, obviously this is, speed, this is sped up to a degree, but we see the decompression. It's a wide decompression. It's a midline incision, open incision. And you see the, the dura right here. This is cephalad, this is caudal. Uh, this is not exactly how quickly I move. This is about how quickly my uh, resident Vince moves, but this is following the decompression. We place the pedicle screws and then now we're, we're looking at the device. You can see the pedicle screws here and here when the hands move, you can see the, the, the pedicle screw there, there. Here's the dura in the middle, getting the implant prepared. So we trial the device, we size the device, put a couple cc's of saline into the device, and then here's the device actually being implanted. It's pedicle screw based. There's the tulips. The tulips are turned laterally as opposed to caudal cephalad. And then here's the final device with the locking screws in. And again, how the device sits. Here's the, this same patient's final x-rays and a nice midline placement, and again, maintenance of motion. And uh, thanks to Vince, my, uh, uh, our, our chief resident who put this together for us. Uh, but that is, in a nutshell is, uh, is the actual uh, procedure, pretty straightforward. If we look at the IDE results, again, we did our first formal look at 249 patients. The, it has now been completed enrollment out to 300 patients. It is a two to one randomization with the tops uh, versus the T lift, single level L2 to L5. We talked about some of the inclusion exclusion criteria. You see them here. Uh, and if you look at the, the subjects, we had 170 tops patients in this first cohort that we examined at two year follow up with 79 T lift patients. These were our primary endpoints, uh, ODI, VAS, and reoperation rates. We had secondary endpoints. This is some of the demographics, pretty class, straightforward stuff for degenerative spondylolisthesis. Here is the actual clinical study sites. 30, there were 37 of which in the United States. There was a nice mix of geographically East Coast, Midwest, West Coast, as well as private and academic practices, as you see here. Here's the some of the, the demographics from surgery, 
Um, blood loss, 200 cc's, operative time around three hours, length of stay, three days, pretty straightforward um, stuff and really no sig statistically significant difference between the control or the uh, uh, investigational TOPS group. Here's the ID clinical results. Uh, and the composite clinical success rate was made uh, based on having no secondary surgical interventions, no device breakage, uh, at least a 15% ODI improvement, and no neurological deficit. So we, when we look at the composite success rate, we see 85 to 64. This is statistically, st statistically significant and superior results for the overall clinical success rate. Uh, and, and the rate for T-lift, the T-lift, if you look at the T-lift category as well as the overall, it really functioned reasonably. It was just that the tops functioned very well in this cohort. If we look at surgical reinterventions, re and that's really where the rubber meets the road when it comes to spondylolisthesis and you're discussing decompression alone versus decompression and stabilization, we see a small surgical uh, uh, reintervention rate uh, in the top study at 2.9%. And it's small in the T-lift as well at 6.3%, but the top study is, 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 is remarkably smaller. You see the actual indications for the surgical um, reoperations. And the reason I was harping on the, six, the, the reoperation rate is because in a lot of ways, that those are the differences we see for these various studies that it, were prospective randomized studies that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. We see the uh, the Swedish study, we see the uh, um, the SLIP study, uh, and then the Norwegian study. And again, if you look at the ODI improvements at two years for the uh, TLIF group, you see 16% uh, uh, in the Swedish, 21 for the Norwegian and 26 for the SLIP study. In this cohort, it actually functioned better. The top study ODI improvement at two years was, was higher than what is in the published literature, and it was still overcome by the TOPS, by, by the tops cohort. As far as where, where we're going to move from here, I think there's a lot of room to move. We have hybrid solutions where you can look at both fusion with uh, uh, motion preservation. You can, there is some synergy between uh, artificial disc and posterior replacement. Uh, we see the device shrinking. We can move it into the minim minimally invasive realm and it can certainly be moved to outpatient arena like one level T-lifts have routinely done as well. So we feel like there's, uh, there's a lot of room to move here with this device and this procedure. This is the, the, the study that has been published uh, in Journal of Neurosurgery Spine that was the 249 patient cohort that we discussed. So this is in the literature. It is now available on, it is available online. Thank you for your attention. And we've got some other great talks coming up and be happy to answer any questions afterwards. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Dr. Cork. You provided us with great insight in, into the promise of facet replacement. I'd like to switch gears a bit and pivot toward the science behind posterior motion preservation devices. There is tremendous preclinical research and testing that takes place during the product development phase. All this takes place well before a device reaches the clinical stage. We are fortunate to have with us tonight Professor Vilke, who is a world renowned expert in the field of bio, spine biomechanics. Professor Vilke is the co director of the Institute for Orthopedic Research and Biomechanics at the University of Ulm where he heads spine research. Since 2001, he's been the deputy editor of the European Spine Journal, where he is responsible for basic research. He has also held the role of president of the German Spine Society and president of the Spine Society of Europe. For many years, he has served as the head of the science committee of the German Spine Society, and he is currently president of the German Spine Foundation. He has authored or co-authored more than 350 peer-reviewed publications, 60 book chapters, and has been editor of five books in, special, in several special issues in well-respected spine journals. Professor Vilke is a mechanical engineer with a PhD in biomechanics and is a lecturer of experimental surgery and a professor for biomechanics. It is my pleasure to hand the podium over to Professor Vilke. 
So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to, to give this uh, presentation. Actually a presentation about a study which performed many, many years ago, uh, roughly around 2005 or so. But I always like to mention this study because uh, this was a study which was performed uh, together with the company, uh, which was done as it usually should be. So they came with an implant. We tested the implant. Uh, they had an idea where they are in the range of what they <clears throat> were expecting. But they took the implant home and uh, did continue to do some homework to uh, improve the implant and then they came back. And this was done in total three times, so in three loops. What I will present you now in this uh, presentation is only the last loop because this is the relevant one. So uh, we already have heard in the last presentation that we have uh, uh, different possibilities of motion preserving technologies and I will not go into the anterior implants. And uh, we have seen that the total posterior disc, uh, the total posterior arthroplasty is something special from the posterior implants. And I will only concentrate on this now. Uh, but in general, the goal of all these implants is that we want to restore the physiological function of a motion segment in terms of flexibility. And for the posterior implants, uh, we can preserve the disc. Therefore, we would also keep the disc loading in the physiological region. And um, of course, uh, we want to somehow mimic or uh, allow the, the facet joint function. Um, this Technologies are necessary if we want to eliminate negative effects from uh, either due morphological changes, that means degeneration or so, or after decompression nucleotomy, or in this case for this study, after the removal of the facet joints. And here you see once more this TOPS system. Um, the advantage of this implant is that it is easy to fix to the motion segment through an anterior approach, a posterior approach. And it's a quite familiar technology to most of the surgeons. You have already seen that before. Interesting uh, uh, feature of this implant is also that the, the material properties of this <clears throat> uh, material uh, the, the implant is made of can be modified with different stiffnesses. And this gave the company the opportunity that they were able to play uh, with the stiffness of these different material components and also with the different components of the implant per se in order to optimize the implant to the specific requirement. So what we did in our test was that we, um, that we used six specimens in total in each loop with a representative age range from L3 to S1. And we tested them in our spine tester um, under intact conditions. Then after we simulated the defect or placed the defect, uh, which was a bilateral laminectomy and a facetectomy. And uh, afterwards, we tested the, uh, the, the whole uh, uh, thing with uh, after the implantation. Here you see in principle the, 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 the boundary conditions and the data, how we tested our implant, which were fixed in this uh, spine tester. And we we're able in this spine tester to apply plus minus 7.5 Newton meters in all the three principal motion planes. That means in flexion extension, in lateral bending to the right and the left, and in axial rotation also to the left and the right. 
And uh, this was usually done or is done with 3.5 loading cycles and the evaluation is then taken from the third complete cycle. The tests were performed without preload, which is following internationally accepted uh, recommendations how to do this implant test. And what we did on top was that we measured the intradiscal pressure inside the disc. And here you see on the right-hand side in this X-ray, how the pressure transducer is placed almost ideally in the center of the nucleus where you have a hydrostatic pressure if the disc is not uh, degenerate too much. And another thing what, which was special in, in this experiment that's, that was that we measured the range of motion in axial rotation as a function in different postures. That means that we change the position between flexion and different extension degrees. Uh, that means we put the implant, uh, the, the, the motion segment into two degrees of flexion in neutral position <clears throat> in minus one, minus two, minus three, and minus four degrees of extension. And we always applied the plus minus 7.5 Newton meters for in axial rotation. And what, what that means, I will show you in a, in a second. Here you see the spine tester, how it moves the specimen. Here you see the implant in place. And this is here the motion analysis system that we could record each motion, um, each motion um, of each segment. And here you can see the cable running down from the pressure transducer, which was fixed to the disc. And now we come to the results. Here you see the, the data or the, the, the results of the range of motion for flexion and extension. In green, you will always see uh, the data for the intact specimen, in red for the defect, and in blue with the implant in place. What you can also see here is the range of motion in flexion is five degrees in, in that are medium values. And um, in extension, it's roughly minus three degrees. So a little bit more flexion than extension. And what you can also see this here that the, the dark bars are the neutral zone. And the neutral zone is a measure for the laxity. That means you need very little load in order to create this range of motion. And then the, the segments become stiffer because the ligaments play an important role then. And what you can see is after our defect with the uh, facetectomy, we see a large increase in the range of motion, both in flexion and also even more in extension because the facets are not there anymore. And you can also see that the, the neutral zone is dramatically increasing, which makes a very unstable situation and a very lax, uh, instable situation. And then you can see with the top system, uh, inflection, you almost have an ideal reconstruction of the range of motion. So you get rid of this increased range of motion and it's a little bit more in extension, but Overall, it's roughly 85%. In lateral bending, you see again an increase in the, the range of motion, not as dramatically as in flexion extension. Um, but what you can see with the implant in place, you can almost ideally um, reconstruct the range of motion. And in axial rotation, you see basically the strongest effect. The range of motion is almost threefold because you don't have the facet joints anymore, which block the axial rotation. And um, with the implant in place again, they are almost ideally restored.
And here we see the actual rotation with respect to the posture, which I was uh, uh, mentioning at the beginning. Here you see, and this is something which I find quite fascinating, you have a much larger range of motion in flexion than in neutral position. And the further you bend backwards, the smaller the range of motion gets. And this is exactly what uh, would happen with the real facet joints in place, because the more you go backwards, the more they block and the smaller the range of motion uh, in X rotation can take part. And this is the only implant I'm aware of, which is able to mimic this function in such a nice way. This is due to this conic uh, piece inside a conic core inside the implant, because this is where you lift off a little bit or you go down and then you have much less mobility. And this is how you can create this. And this was optimized with these different loops of experiments. And here uh, you see what happens with the intertestinal pressure. If you again compare the red curve after the defect with the green one for the intact specimen, you see that there is a strong increase in the, the pressure and you get a completely different um, curve as compared to the intact state. And you see with the implant in place, you get back almost to the physiological conditions in the intradiscal pressure. This is the case for flexion extension, also for lateral bending, and also for axial rotation, what you can see here. Again, an increased pressure, a stronger V-shaped curve, and almost ideal uh, restoration of the pressure after the implantation. So in conclusion, you have seen that uh, the company has done its homework and it that uh, they were able to optimize this top system in a series of experiment. Uh, this top system is able to restore the physiological movement in an L45 motion segment, also the disc pressure after bilateral laminectomy and the facetectomy. And we saw that the movement in axial rotation and lateral bending was almost exactly as in an intact segment. In flexion extension, the rate range of motion was roughly 85% of the intact state, which I personally think is better than if you have an increased one, because then you guarantee a little bit more stability, but still enough motion. And the fascinating thing with this implant is that in actual rotation, the range of motion is posture dependent. And this is really simulating the facet joints. And uh, if you want to read more details about this study and uh, you want to remember the results, please uh, refer to this publication, which we published already in 2006. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I'm happy to take questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all of your presentations. I can see already we have quite a few questions. So, Professor Wilkie, let's start with you. Uh, could you elaborate a bit on the testing that took place in your lab uh, and really how it integrated the development process, how it was integrated with the development process of the TOPS system? Actually, it was like this. When they came for the very first time uh, to my place, they showed me the implant. And uh, they discussed with me how they could perform an equivalent testing and uh, how they could prove that the, the implant is mimicking what it's supposed to do. And then we discussed it and uh, we worked out a protocol together with them. And then uh, a few months later, they came with the first prototype. And we performed the whole series of uh, tests with six specimens at least. And um, we realized that the implant was not perfectly mimicking the 
ideal uh, situation of the intact specimen. Uh, you know, in one rain, in one motion, the implant was too stiff. In the other one, it was not stiff enough, and so on. So they took the data back home, and uh, they modified the implant. And then they thought, "Oh, now we have a good solution. Now we are there." And they came again. We performed exactly the same test again. That was maybe one or two years later. I do not remember. Um, and um, it was much better that I thought, okay, pretty good implant, but uh, they were not happy yet. And they took the data again, improved the implant and came back with the, with the implant, which, we, which I was presenting. And uh, now I, I think you could see that the implant is mimicking quite nicely uh, the facet joint behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, during this discussion, we also added this other test uh, that we mimicked, uh, that, we, that we tested it in the different postures, because that was an idea which we didn't think about at the beginning. But after many discussions and so on, we thought, oh, maybe that is also quite interesting, because I've started to understand uh, the internal parts of the implant. And here we go. That was uh, then what we did. And that was what we presented. So the company was very much involved in the, in the protocol. And um, I think we both learned a lot. It sounds like it was, a, it was a really interesting collaborative effort. And I really enjoyed the iterations that you just described. Uh, and again, all through all of that process, I assume you were you were moving very singularly towards your main objective. Absolutely. And actually, I think this is an, a, a very positive example mm -hmm. how an implant should be designed, and that you do that you can do uh, a lot of preclinical testing. In, in a very useful way, at the end of the day, you will succeed with the implant. If you don't do this homework, you may have the problem that it's not going to be successful in the patient. Well, you build this foundation and you can see the outcomes in the, in the low revision rates and, and really the nice ODI scores. Hi, Dom. Um, you know, new technologies, as we know, come often with a challenging learning curve. Uh, could you describe what the learning curve for TOPS might be and perhaps the differences in surgical technique between TOPS uh, compared to a standard fusion system uh, yeah, procedure? I, I, I would say, and I think that the IDE data um, um, bears this out, Robin, is, is that it is very similar to um, standard TLIF, and the analogy is artificial disc versus ACDF. I think with cervical artificial disc, you have to have a little pay a little more attention to sy symmetry and nuance, and it's the exact same thing with TOPS. It, so it is, it is a familiar, you know, straightforward workhorse approach to the spine, posterior lumbar spine. It's an open approach, so you have all the anatomy laid out. Uh, the, the little more attention to details, you want to make sure that you really have that wide decompression. And then um, in terms of the pedicle screws, you want them as long as they can be, and you want them uh, symmetrical. And, uh, and so it is really just a, a matter of paying attention to nuance. Literally, I'd tell you, I felt like my fifth case, I was as good as I am with my 50th case. Uh, so I would say the learning curve is a handful of cases. Uh, like we talked about, the other thing that I think is important is uh, is the patient selection, like like with any operation. Um, but it is a straightforward procedure, uh, and it is a biomechanically robust device. Kind of the other question that I get frequently is is that you know it, everyone's trained that the fusion is what makes it permanent, and then rods and screws will loosen if you don't get a fusion, and that's when you're trying to hold something together that doesn't want to be held together. I think with the, as you have heard with our other speakers today, quite eloquently, uh, the, the, this segment is not being held 
uh, um, together. It, it's a segment that wants to have motion. It has motion, so you're not stressing out the screws. And to me, that you know, that's been borne out by my 15 plus year follow up. Is that I just don't see screw loosening. In fact, with that initial cohort, I had a couple of patients where I actually had to revise because of the next level. They didn't have a problem with the device, but five, 10 years, 15 years later, they had a problem with the next level. And my idea was that I would just take out the TOPS device and I would just do put in new screws and do a standard fusion. And I couldn't get those old screws out. I literally just had to turn the tulips and use the existing screws because there was no evidence of, of loosening whatsoever. And, and that to me was, 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 a, was, was kind of a surprising result. That's really significant. And again, let me reiterate, that's a 15 year uh, history you have. And I wanna pick on, on one thing you said and kick it over to Dr. Anikstein. And that is the you mentioned no shortcuts. And I can imagine if you could, if you're moving from fusion to use to the TOPS procedure, could you expand a little bit on your comment about no shortcuts as you're learning this new procedure? As, as Don Corrick just said, there are a few things that are a little different from doing fusion. And one of them is achieving very wide decompression. We don't want to leave the pulse. We don't want to leave part of the facet because it will interfere with the motion. It, it will change the kinematics of the segments. And this may be uh, also, um, uh, may, may be, cause damage to the implant. So I want to have a very wide decompression, no bone to bone uh, left. The other is the symmetry. The, it is a unitary um, implant. So I don't want one, a, two, a couple of screws on the right side to be close together and the other screws are apart. Uh, otherwise the implant will be obliquely uh, applied to the spine. So I want symmetry. I want the same size of implant on both sides and our special tools that were de developed to, to get this symmetry and to make sure the implant can get in and it will be on one plane. So we, we, I don't have one screw too deep inside, one's too, uh, too proud. So there are special tools to allow, to, to help the surgeon to achieve that. And we just have to go by the, by the book. By the book. That's, that's wonderful. Well, uh, and again, uh, we are just getting a lot of questions and that's really a testament to the great presentations all three of you gave today. And let me remind the audience, we are gonna have two more masterclasses on this subject. And I think all of you can understand why. This is really interesting. It's something really worth learning about. Uh, I am sorry we could not get to all of your questions. We've run out of time. So again, thank you, gentlemen. Really terrific program. We will get back to every question that you sent in in writing, and we'll make sure that Dr. Wilkie, Dr. Anikstein, Dr. Korik uh, respond. Gentlemen, again, uh, well, before we leave, do let me just ask Dr. Wilkie, uh, perhaps, do you have any parting thoughts before we close out this, uh, this call, and as well for you, Dr. Korik, as you, Dr. Anikstein, did start off, Dr. Wilkie, if you don't mind. Okay, uh, so thank you very much for the invitation again. I, I'm happy that I was able to present you uh, what we found, although it was many, many years ago. But I want to emphasize this is a really good example of how you should develop an implant. Yeah. And I wish the implant all the, all the success it deserves. Very good. Uh, Dr. Korik. From my perspective, like I said, we've been involved with new technology. It's one of our interests for the past you know, 20, 25 years. And, and we've all seen some technologies that have kind of come and go. And, and to me, I, I would say that this is something that started, you know, artificial facets started in 2004, 2005. So it's been vetted over 15 years. It's got a good experience overseas in Europe, et cetera, in Israel and Australia. Uh, and so this is a device, I think, whose time has come. And this is, so this isn't, again, you know, when you talk about new devices first in its class, you think it, maybe it's something that got invented 15 minutes ago or two weeks ago. It's been going on for 15 years. It's got a real nice evidence basis associated with it, including very positive results from the IDE study. 
And so I, I think this is really the last man standing with artificial facet, but it's going to be the first one of a whole new generation. And I'm excited to see the technology come into a market. Yeah, I could not agree more, Dr. Anikstein. Yeah, I was a little disappointed that uh, the motion preservation is now you know, out of fashion. It was there was a high, high, uh, or maybe golden years of the motion preservation, and then many surgeons uh, left this uh, idea, and most surgeons look for less invasive surgery. I think this solution has real benefit over fusion, and maybe with time we'll see it has benefit on decompression only as well. So uh, I think it won't be easy to persuade other surgeons to move forward and go to this motion preservation technology and maybe get a little aside from this thinking of doing it less and less invasive and trying to make it better. Make it better. That's, yeah. Let's close on that comment. Make it better. Thank you to everybody, all of our master faculty this evening. Uh, just personally, I want to say uh, this was one of our best master classes. I learned a lot, and uh, and we are talking through a really interesting new emerging technology. Uh, I we will not be able to get all to all the questions as we've run out of time. We will, however, be uh, asking our faculty to respond to the questions in writing, and we'll get them back to each of the folks that uh, sent in their questions. Again, really, really uh, excellent presentations, and thank you to each member of the faculty. I would finally uh, say thank you, most importantly, to our audience. We can't do our master classes without you. Uh, we do run about two of these a month, and we'll have more on the very important subject of facet replacement uh, technologies in the coming months, and mostly uh, in uh, uh, 2023. So to our audience, Thank you again. Have a good night. And I look forward to seeing you at future master classes. <laughs>